today we continue our exploration of the Gloom Spite kits with the Trogoths. Certainly one of the most exciting additions to this faction. These are the lumbering behemoths that act as the strong arm of the Gloom Spite kits. And so in this video, we're going to cover what they are, how they fit into the grander army, and kind of go over the specific units as we normally do. Now, Trogoth is a super broad term given to a wide variety of beasts across the Moral Realms. This is what used to be referred to as trolls back in Weimar fantasy battles. They are largely shaped by their environment, and they seem very adaptable. That's going to be a theme we come to again and again, is how adaptable they truly are. But despite their various adaptations, they all have some pretty common traits in that they are all massive, lumbering, very low intelligence creatures. They have some measure of thought, uh, but nothing really complex. They kind of cap out at using things as clubs, as kind of an intellectual level. And they can be found across every single mortal realm living in the most inhospitable places, the craggy caves, toxic swamps, under mountains, and they really take on the essence of wherever they are. Now, when enough Trogus come together, they form what's called a Trog herd. There's no real size limitation here, uh, but they're generally few in numbers. The main reason they stick to being more isolated is a very practical one, and that is hunger. They're universally always hungry, and a larger pack means more mouths to compete with. And that really is kind of their natural state. There might be three or four of them clumped together in an area, but generally speaking, they're not large congregations of them. However, that all changes when a dank old trog boss comes around. We'll talk about that in a little bit, but it's unclear why, but they seem very magnetic. This magnetism doesn't come through charismatic speech, but it's kind of an instinctual thing and they are followed. They're followed by every single trog herd they walk through. In this way, a trog boss will begin to collect smaller trog herds and form in heavy, heavy air quotes what can be called an army. But really what it is is sort of this ever-growing snowball of trogoths that are just kind of coming to follow in his trail. And this trog boss will start traveling in roughly a straight line, which is an interesting thing, that they just kind of pick a direction and nothing stops them from going there. And this is through battlefields of wars between different factions they have nothing to do with, uh, cities, forests, etc., and they're eating everything and everyone in their path. There are a few ideas as to why this happens or why a trog boss will just start walking in a singular direction. And some people believe that uh, he's following the path of the bad moon. The bad moon went over ahead of him and he's just literally following after it, uh, carving this perfectly straight line through a realm. Some other conflicting ideas believe that he's actually setting the course for a bad moon. That is to say, uh, he will walk that direction and later the bad moon will pass over it. So the idea being he's kind of getting ahead of it or maybe even laying the tracks. There's no definitive answer, but whatever the reason is, their path seems to be tied to the bad moon as well. And the moon clan and spider fang have proven time and time again to be able to lead the trogoths to a good fight, which is where they eat the dead, the dying, and the enemy. So it's kind of this great mutual relationship we see coming again and again within this faction that uh, Grots don't subjugate Trogoths, but their interests overlap so stinking well. And if a few Grots go missing because the Trogoths needed a snack, who would even notice? Because their value far exceeds their hunger in the eyes of the Gloom Spike Gits. And since both factions are tied to the Bad Moon, it makes sense that like, they would be out looking for food while the bad moon is up in the air. The Grots can point them in a the direction of an enemy. They'll go ahead and devour them. And the last little note here I want to cover on the Trogoths is their ability to heal. And this is a theme we keep seeing again and again, as I mentioned before, but adapting to their environment. The ability to heal and evolve has their bodies constantly adapting to wherever they are. As mentioned, they live in the darkest, most toxic environments ever. Because it hurts them, they heal in a way that compensates for it. So small cuts and scrapes will heal away in seconds, and only devastating blows can actually kill one. And this works to their benefit and their detriment, because shrugging off attacks is obviously wonderful for very clear reasons, but combined with low intelligence, they often will be taking damage and not realize that they're in danger. Someone could be on their back hitting their skull for several seconds before they go, oh, and look up and actually get him off. So he, they are taking damage more than they can comprehend how to stop it. Now there's only four units here, but I absolutely love them all. So we're going to start kind of with some of the lower ones and work our way up. And the bottom of the barrel I can find, at least in terms of grossness, is the Fell Water Trogoths. 
And they are certainly the nastiest of all these units, and really actually a probably the best display of their adaptability. These are the Trogoths that inhabit the murky, toxic swamps of the realms, and so they've, they've evolved, if you will, to have this kind of semi-aquatic lifestyle, which is great, because if you look on the model, there's all kinds of fins and things like that, it perfectly fits. Their tough hide and scales let them sit in filth of the realms. Like, it's just pure nastiness, corrosion. They can just sit in there and wade until something comes near them and they can pounce on it and eat. In addition to, like, personal, like, exterior evolutions like that, they've also developed a really cool new trait. Whereas, if they kind of convulse their stomach enough, they can actually vomit up toxic bile. This kind of takes the form as like a very crude ranged attack that is devastating on lightly armored yammies. It's corrosive nature able to eat apart its victims. And side little note here is that they're, uh, to complement that bile attack, they also have an odor so bad that the sternest war bosses will struggle to breathe. And so I love the way these models blended in here because of they, they really did harp on the adapting to their environment, kind of that micro-evolution type thing. Uh, where they just look like they belong in a swamp. They just fit that so well. Next up are the Rock Gut Trogoths. This is another example of Trogoth microevolution, if you will, and they have evolved around the harsh stone mountains of the realm. And they can easily be confused with piles of rock or a crude sculpture made by a bad artist because they just outwardly look like rocks and they're dusty and all that kind of stuff. But the illusion shatters the second they stumble to life and begin to eat victims around them. They crawl out of these mountainous cave systems, things like that, anything from around them, and they carve these crude homes with vast tunnel networks within them. They eat the bedrock of the realms themselves to dig in there. And that constant eating of rock and being around it and kind of saturating themselves with it has begun to change them. They've developed these thick stone-like hides, even more resistant to damage and magic. And it almost makes them a sort of a geomancer, able to manipulate rock themselves as if it were water. In the hands of any other creature, or really just a wizard or something like that, this would be an incredible power to be able to warp the earth around you into whatever form you wish. But here's the caveat, is that rock gut tragas are so dumb, they just use this extraordinary power to make super crude clubs, or they make boulders they can chuck at the enemy. Either way though, they just follow their passion, which is to make blunt objects and crush, smash, and trample. Next up are the Dankhold Trogoths. Now this is an entirely new unit that we got here, and these are loners, even by the standards of an otherwise antisocial species. They seek the darkest depths, the deepest tunnels for isolation, where they take long naps that can last decades or even centuries. And while they're slumbering, their bodies change to fit their environment, and when I say fit their environment, I don't mean like they kind of the microevolution thing where they take on traits of what's near them. I mean they literally fit their environment in terms of actual scale and size. So if a extremely tall Dankhold Trogoth goes into a tiny, tiny cavern and he falls asleep, he, is, he will actually shrink himself down to be more proportional with his environment. Likewise, if a smaller one goes into a massive cavern chamber, he will grow while he's sleeping to accommodate the size disparity. Now, Moon Clan Shaman think this dramatic change is related to their diet, because while they'll eat anything just like any other Trogoth would, they have a particular love for fungus that grows on Realmstone, which is the concept we discussed in a previous video, and I'll try to remember to link it down below, but Realmstone is really just concentrated magic, I'll put that very simply, and the fungus that grows on it would be imbued with some of that power. They can't eat the Realmstone itself, although some have tried, but they tend to die pretty pretty quickly, uh, but they can eat the stuff that grows on it, and that raw infusion of magic to them does warp and twist them, and so that's their theory right now, is that this has to do with their massive metabolic changes, the size change, and makes them more resistant to hostile magics. Now, while they're sleeping, other things are happening too. There's fungus growing on their backs, stalagmites on their shoulders, and this kind of, when, they, when this creature comes out of the dark into the battlefield, he acts as a very reassuring presence for the Moon Clan Grotz because he is really a simple reminder of home brought to, like, it's kind of a comfort brought to the battlefield. Another way to look at it is he's kind of like an idol of what the mountains are, their entire environment, their home. He looks like that being brought outside into a very alien world. So it inspires confidence in a big way. 
Now, here's the thing, as much confidence as they bring their allies and inspiration to that, they bring absolute dread and terror to their enemies. Because it would take an entire army's worth of firepower to bring one down completely, and every shot that they fire at the Dankhold Trogoth is a shot they're not firing at Moon Clan Grotz, who are coming at them full speed, laughing and cackling. Now, I do want to make a side note here and say that there is a named Dankhold Trogoth. This is Molog the Mighty, and his story is a fun one where he was sleep slumbering in a cave under Shayish when the Skaven burrowed in and they were looking to expand their territory. Well, in their act of doing so, they roused Molog to anger, and he woke up super ticked, smashed dozens of them, absolutely wrecked their ambition for growing in that region to the point where they gave up, and for Skaven to give up on an area is quite a bit. You know, I mean, he had to really smash their spirits. But even though he drove the Skaven off, his home was overrun and now dangerous, so he didn't want to go back to sleep. So he began wandering. He wandered, and a crowd of fun little creatures followed behind him. Being in Shyish, he somehow wandered directly into the city of Shadespire, and now he wanders the city in Shadespire and Nightfall, the expansion for it, endlessly searching for a place to chill out and go back to sleep. Which I don't know why I love that so much, as the guy's just looking for a place to take a nap, and I think that fits in so well. And the last unit we have here is the Dankhold Trog Boss. These are the crude rulers of the Darkest Steps, the Trog bosses slumber away the ages. They are covered in all manner of mold and rock formations built from ages of being immobile. And after centuries of eating realmstone infected fungus, their bodies have become the toughest of hides. They are the eldest of their kin, their size is incredible, and their power is unquestionable. But what truly makes them unique cannot be seen. Because as we mentioned at the top of the episode, they exude this kind of power or of authority and magnetism around them. The weight of their presence pulls all nearby Trogoths to them. As such, they become the centerpiece of any Trog herd binding them all together. And here's the thing, no one's really sure why one would ever awaken from their slumber, but once they are awake, they just kind of move inexorably towards the surface at this kind of determined pace. And not just pace, that almost roughly straight line that we talked about at the beginning, pulling all the desperate Trogoths along the way. It's described as being a slow moving avalanche with of course the Trog boss at the lead. So they are truly awe-inspiring on the battlefield. They can decimate defenses with a swipe of their club, his tough skin healing by the moment, and even scarier is their propensity to collect treasures from the dead. Now, that's not usually a bad thing. Most of the time it's just harmless little trinkets soldier might have, but sometimes it's a potent magical artifact or weapon. He collects them for being shiny, but inadvertently makes these behemoths even more deadly, which is why you can have this character in the game take artifacts. Okay, so those are the units. There's not many of them, as I said before, but let's talk about why is this sub-faction, as small as it is, so cool, and what does it add to the army? I'm going to be... Totally honest, this is my favorite of all of them. Of all the Gloom Spite sub factions put together, I like these guys for a lot of reasons. Now, there are models from the others that I like. I like the Arachnorok and the Fanatic, but none come close to this sub faction as a whole. Because it hits a lot of notes for me, things that I find fascinating. There are incredibly tough models, and the regeneration ability is awesome. The adaptability that is talked about in every single one of these entries in the Battle Tome. Uh, really I find fascinating because uh, kind of like how they, like squigs can constantly be bred and evolve to change and so there's different kinds of squigs, same thing here, just on a much larger scale. And here's the thing, when you're designing yours, it's not just a matter of what environment are they in locally, but you can also incorporate like the realm. So for example, what does a fellwater trogoth from Akshi look like? Well, that water might be more ashen, right? It might be choked with smog of different colors and things like that. So they like their natural propensity to change and evolve to what's around them gives you as a painter and player a chance to really flesh out the backstory of your army and show it in a meaningful way. In addition to that, I love the, the contrast of a really good thing with a really bad thing. So this is what I mean in this example. I love that every one of these entries has these guys being extremely powerful and with a deadly kind of resiliency, they're each individually so hard to take down and can kill so many people on their own. But that's all tempered by the fact that they're so unintelligent and antisocial that nothing really big tends to happen from that. 
If they had an ounce more brains that can organize, like, they would be one of the most devastating fighting forces in the realms. Again, still few in number, but if they were smart about it, they could do a lot more. But I love that that amazing strength is just tempered by this crippling weakness of, but they're just too dumb. Now, moving away from the lore stuff into a hobbyist perspective, I love the idea of a super elite, low model count army. I know it's not particularly great in scenario play, but it allows me as a painter to throw a ton of detail and effort into every single one without losing my mind. One thing I've noticed is that all of the Gloomspite Gits factions can really exist alone, and I feel like they're a complete story. They have enough flavor to exist in isolation. But the way that their interests meet, if we were making a Venn diagram of like Spider Fang, Moon Clan, and Traga, it's like that overlap section where they all come together makes perfect sense. These guys want food. They see a flood of Grots headed in a direction, and they know food is that way. Grots want to have big baddies with them when they go to fight. And so it's this mutual relationship that makes a logical sense. And that's something we don't see a lot within Battle Tomes. We see it on a grander scale, like between them. So like, for example, Daughters of Cain and Stormcast or Free Peoples, uh, they work together for the greater good because we're all against chaos. It's, it's, you know, allies of convenience type thing. But not many other factions have it interwoven within the same book that that's how they operate. Beasts of Chaos is the part of the closest one, but even then, they're much more uh, related, I guess, closer together on a species level than anything in the Gloom Spike gets. Right, Grots have no, like, real relation blood-wise to Atrogoth. And as I said before, Gloom Spike gets lore strength is putting the army in the context of the realms. Filling the world with these nearly mythical creatures who fill the role of ancient legends but expand upon it does just that. They are a fantastic addition to the Gloom Spike gets and the setting as a whole. And I'd love to see books where, uh, coming from Black Library novelists, where we encounter these creatures, the Trogoths, in their natural environments. Not as part of some grand Gloomspite Gits army, but just out there in the wild. Show me what they're like. Because I think they would provide some extremely fun narrative fight sequences, as well as um, challenges for Grud heroes. So friends, that's all my thoughts on the Trogoths of the Gloomspite Gits. Let me ask you this, which one is your favorite? I'm going to say I really, I really love the classic Fellwater Trogoth model. He, he's really great. The three you get, I love their pose, I love everything about them. But I want to hear yours. Leave in the comments down below. And I'll see you in tomorrow's video as we explore the leaders of the Gloomspite Gits.